and welcome everyone. My name is Tina Lerno and I'm a librarian on the digital content team and part of the Los Angeles Public Library. Hello everyone, I'm Meredith Sires. I'm a children's librarian at the Arroyo Seco branch, the Los Angeles Public Library. And it is our pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for uh, our talk with writer Laurel Snyder, and we are going to be discussing her new book, The Witch of Woodland. If you have comments or questions, please put them in the chat and we will be answering them towards the end of the program. And also don't forget to email ECDEPT at, it's right there at lapl.org for your chance to be entered into an opportunity drawing to win a copy of The Witch of Woodland. Uh, we also want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, as well as the Library Foundation and our amazing behind the scenes staff for helping the library bring these author and illustrator programs to you virtually. Uh, and thank you all so very much. Uh, we would also like to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land. We recognize and acknowledge their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants. And for information on which territory you may reside, check out native-land.ca. Now on to today's Your Author program. The Los Angeles Public Library is proud to present author Laurel Snyder as she discusses her new middle grade novel, The Witch of Woodland. It introduces Zipporah Chava, McConnell as she prepares for her bat mitzvah and comes into her own with mysterious abilities. So without further ado, let's welcome Laurel onto the screen. Hey. Welcome. Hi, Laurel. Hi, thank and you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for thanks for being here. And I heard you were going to read a little bit uh, from your book. We would love sure. that. Sure. And I, I have to confess, this is the first time I've read this passage. So uh so I'm going to do my best. Um, and in this scene, uh, her mother, Zippy and her mother are sitting down with the rabbi for the very first time. And Zippy is not sure about this whole bat mitzvah thing. So let's start at the beginning then. Maybe I got ahead of myself. This is the rabbi talking. A bat mitzvah is a life cycle event, Zippy, a way of marking change. It's also the moment you become a full member of the community. It's a kind of transformation. Transformation? You're not a little kid anymore, said Rabbi Dan. You're growing up, becoming a Jewish woman. It's exciting and we just want to celebrate with you. Um, becoming a woman? I said, squirming a little in my seat. Jewish or otherwise, I'm not very womanly. I mean, I wear a bra, but I don't need one. I just more wear it so that nobody in PE class points out how I'm not wearing a bra when we dress out. One reason seventh grade is weird is because some people are suddenly twice as tall as they were last year and you see tampon wrappers on the bathroom floor when you pee. But if you haven't started to change much yourself, that can all be awkward, uncomfortable. But I obviously didn't say any of that to Rabbi Dan. All I said was, but what if I'm not ready to transform? What if I still feel like a kid? That's not a bad thing at all, said Rabbi Dan with a grin. The truth is I still feel like a kid myself sometimes. In fact, I think we should all carry our childhood with us. Remember to see the world through curious eyes. All I mean to say is that no matter what you do, your mind and your heart are growing up, Zippy. You're capable of doing and feeling new things, taking on new responsibilities, you know? I nodded because I could tell he wanted me to, and I was grateful he was trying so hard, actually listening to me way more than B or mom. But I still didn't totally understand what he meant or why I needed a bat mitzvah any more than a fall fling or a walking group. Why did everyone suddenly want me to be different? I liked my life the way it was. Also, he continued, you're making important decisions for yourself now, Zippy, like the very choice to become bat mitzvah. That's part of adulthood too, that agency and power. It's a significant step, don't you agree? Well, I said, kind of, I guess, though I didn't exactly have a choice if you want to know the truth. It's nice here, but I didn't choose to come. Nobody asked me. Mom gave a faint grunt from her spot on the couch, but Rabbi Dan looked straight at me and said, oh, that sounds frustrating. I wonder what would make this someplace you did want to be. I looked over at mom and then back at Rabbi Dan. In that moment, I was also thinking about B, about how this was exactly what she wanted, this transformation thing. We hadn't been in seventh grade a month, but it already felt like she was an entirely different person. 
The thing is, I said, I do like being Jewish the way we are Jewish. The synagogue is nice enough. And it's not like I want to be anything other than Jewish. But I don't really feel like I fit in here the way that other people seem to. I don't feel like we belong. When I said that, Rabbi Dan's eyebrows knitted together and his forehead wrinkled. Can you tell me more, Zippy? The way the people you feel do belong. What do you think makes them different from you? I thought about that for a minute. I guess it just seems like everyone else knows everybody already and what to say and how to be. They all look at home. But I never feel like that. When we come here for the holidays, I feel outside. Like I'm watching a play about a bunch of people in a synagogue. Only I never got the script. Hmm, said Rabbi Dan. Well, to be entirely fair, I think maybe you're making some assumptions about how comfortable all those other people feel. But I also wonder if we can't make this a more welcoming place for you. Where do you feel at ease? I glanced at mom briefly before I tried to answer his question. Well, I, uh, mostly just at home, I guess. With your family, sure, said Rabbi Dan, nodding. Any place else, at school or on a sports team, with a particular friend? I shifted in my seat. I'd been sitting on my foot and it suddenly hurt. I wasn't going to talk to anybody about what had happened with B, and I couldn't bring myself to admit that I basically felt the same way everywhere I went, alone. So I changed the subject. Well, it's not just that, I said. The other thing is, I don't know about the whole faithy part of being Jewish. You know, I, I'm not sure if I actually believe. I love that you're thinking so deeply about this, said Rabbi Dan, nodding. But I wonder which aspects of Judaism trouble you. Which faithy part? Well, I said, thinking a minute, like, for instance, the stories, Noah's Ark or the oil lost in eight days at Hanukkah. Those don't make sense to me. If God was doing miracles back then, wouldn't he be doing miracles nowadays so that the world wouldn't be all messed up with climate change and racism and stuff? Isn't it possible all those Bible stories are just made up? That's a fine question, said the rabbi, a big question. And sure, those stories could all be an invention. But isn't it more fun to be open to wonder, to consider that miracles might be real? Don't you think they're nice ideas? Well, sure, I said, but I don't usually believe in things because they're nice ideas. And it feels kind of wrong to get up in front of everyone on my bat mitzvah and read from the Torah and pretend I believe in what I'm saying if I don't. It feels like I'd be telling a lie. Rabbi Dan waited a minute before he spoke. He looked like he was thinking hard. He picked a green jelly bean out of the bowl, then chewed it slowly. At last, he said, well, I certainly don't want you to lie, but I wonder, Zippy, what makes you think you're supposed to believe that way? What do you mean, I said? Isn't that the whole point of Judaism, to believe in it? Hmm, said Rabbi Dan. Maybe for some. Well, for me, Judaism is most importantly a reason for bringing people together so that we aren't alone in the darkness. So much of the world is unknowable, Zippy, and we all live in a constant state of doubt. It's easier to experience that in community. The world is full of questions. Things we'll never be certain of. Exactly, I shouted without meaning to. I know, that's the whole problem. See, it's infuriating. Ah, said Rabbi Dan. I think I can imagine how that might feel. But for me, the journey, the search for answers is as satisfying as the answers themselves. Questions can be beautiful. Mysteries can bind us to each other, don't you think? I thought about what he'd said for only a moment. Maybe I said, but still, I'd much rather know things for sure. Rabbi Dan smiled. Zippy, I hate to tell you this but the question you are asking right now is itself very Jewish. Your arguments are things the sages have been wrestling with for thousands of years. Okay, I said with a shrug, you say so. Wow. Thank that was you. great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have the, my first question is about where you came up with the idea um, for the Witch of Woodland. And I'm wondering after just hearing the, that passage again, is there, is it autobiographical? Is it based on somebody you know? Well, uh, so I knew that I wanted to write, there's sort of layers to the answer. Mm -hmm. The first answer is, uh, this is my eighth novel for kids. And I've had Jewish characters and intermarried characters in past books. And I have woven, like the Orphan Island has like elements, Judaism sort of woven into it in places that you might notice or you might not. Um, but I hadn't really written a Jewish book. And I do lots of Jewish picture books, but I had not done a Jewish novel. And so it had been in my head with everything that's been happening in the world and talk, conversations about representation and my own frustrations with the ways in which Jewish books tend to kind of feel similar 
Mm-hmm. But I didn't feel I didn't feel like my Jewish community and my Jewish experience was particularly well represented in that world. But the other thing is that with anti-Semitism rising the way that it was, it just felt like I couldn't I couldn't be frustrated with the way that this was all being handled if I wasn't participating. So so I knew in a way that I don't usually do. I knew that I wanted to write a Jewish book and that I was going to set out to do this. And that if I was going to do upper middle grade, which is where my books live, um, there was sort of no skirting bat mitzvah. That like that, if you're going to write about a 12 year old, if you're going to write about an 11 year old or a 13 year old, those middle school years are the name mitzvah years. So I knew that that was sort of a subject I was going to approach. And then I, my kids, my own kids were in those ages. I was sort of in between my two kids uh, bar mitzvahs. And I started talking one day with my younger son about it as we were like in the process of bar mitzvah meetings and things like that. And I asked a really simple question, but I was not prepared for the answer. I said, do you believe in God? And he looked at me and he said, does anybody really know for sure that they believe in God? And it, like it was it, it was just sort of a funny moment of like, that's like that's a place to begin. Right. Like if we if we. <laughs> if we sort of assume that everybody questions that whole idea, and I'm not sure that that's the case. I think my child does not have close friends that are different in that way. Um, but uh, so that's sort of where it began was like, okay, well, if I'm beginning with the understanding that I'm writing about bat the book, and I'm beginning with the ex- expectation that this is a kid who's going to question that very core belief, um, sort of that was sort of where the book began. I yeah. love so that you call that question itself a Jewish question, mm-hmm. because um, you know the scene that precedes the scene with the rabbi is that Zippy is um, told that she's going to get ready for her bat mitzvah, and that concept is so foreign to her because she feels like they don't really go to temple, they don't really belong in the community, and her mom responds. There's no such thing as a part-time Jew. Right. That's right. Which I think is very revealing about her mom's relationship with Judaism. And also a question that a lot of Jews have and revisit, how Jewish am I really? Right. Um, so I-, I wanted to know if you identified with Zippy's point of view when you were growing up and if you could uh, identify when that changed or how that started to change, if it did. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think as an adult at this point in my life, um, I get frustrated with the fact that the Jewish community sometimes comes up with and like this isn't to lay blame, but like comes up with answers for things that like this is a question we should engage with. And the answer. So will somebody will say like, well, you know, is it a is it a faith or an ethnicity? Is it, a you know, these kinds of so it's a peoplehood. And it's like, OK, well, what does that mean? You know, like that that's the answer. What does that mean? Um I felt like when I was, so my mother's not Jewish. I, my, I was raised Jewish in an intermarried family, um, which is also something I write about. Um, and uh, I made a conversion when I was young, sort of to get those issues out of the way. Um, but that doesn't mean every family, and on some level, every family is an intermarried family at this point, almost entirely right there's a grandparent there's a cousin there's a you, your sibling marries somebody who's not jewish and so you you know christmas floats into your life even if even if both everybody in the household is jewish um but for me at that age i knew that i was being raised jewish and that my mother was not and i think that there is something about that in a home that creates a kind of need to ask questions, that the answers are not are not adequate. In a world where what we believe is just what it is, and like it, but your mother doesn't believe the things that you believe, and your mother goes to church. Your mother says she believes in other things. It really creates theological questions in a way that I think sometimes we don't do a good job of handling. Um, and I think that the contemporary world does that too, right? Sort of any any place that the automatic life of your Jewish community would bump into alternatives or people who disagree, um, it, it, it creates questions for people who are question askers and Jews typically are question askers. Um, so I think that a lot of people think about these things and it, there isn't a lot of a, com- there often isn't a comfortable place in in our community to have a big conversation like that if you're not going to a weekly lunch and learn with the rabbi or something. Um, 
And I think a lot of us feel insecure about the things we don't know or the ways in which we don't feel kosher. And so we, we sort of just, we just don't engage with them. Yeah. And I, and I wanted, I mean, I, this book, I hope this is not all that this book is like it, it does other things too, but I did, I really wanted it. I was a kid who was thinking about these things and didn't really have a place to put them. My best friend and I would sometimes talk about things like this, but, um, but I didn't, it wasn't like a family conversation. And so it felt like if I could make a book that could be a family conversation. Um, in my dream world, we'd have like a mother daughter book club or a parent daughter, a parent child book club um, where we could facilitate those conversations for people who wanted them. I, I want that too. <laughs> so great. Um, and, and this, your answer dovetails perfectly to my next, to the next question which is that as librarians, um, we love that Zibby attempts to answer her question through serious research, uh -huh. including amazing search terms, and I won't spoil it, but uh, <laughs> they were really very librarian-y. Yeah. Uh, and how did, how did you, as an author, dive into the topic of, of Jewish magic and- uh, Not- not nearly as efficiently. anything that surprised you that not nearly as efficiently as I wish I had as as sometimes happens I sort of did a poor job with it to begin with began writing the book and then found a bunch of other things that made me go oh now I have to start all over again um yeah I dove the the, the resource that I, I I I bought a bunch of books and I took a bunch of books out of the library and I found a bunch of websites and I talked to a bunch of people and then I found this astounding uh, podcast called Throwing Shade, uh, Better Living Through Jewish Demonology. And made like on a long car ride, made my children listen to like every episode of this podcast <laughs> about like all the different systems of Jewish demons and the their, their multiple Liliths and like just all of this intense, amazing Jewish folklore that really in some ways didn't make its way into, like it was sort of too late when I found it, but made me want to write like 10 other books. Um, uh, but then also led me in other directions. So sort of through that site, I then found some other things that did, you know, um, Instagram feeds and there's a whole Jewish movement out there mm -hmm. that I didn't know existed, um, but but all sorts of you know, like, rituals and and like the ward came in from something that I found online um, and a lot of it is like sort of as resources go like some of the things came from uh, like old Jewish documents that I found pdfs of online there are sort of like the, the there's a um, there's an exorcism element in the book that like those things are rooted in actual religious or apocryphal texts um, but some things I found on like weird Instagram feeds that I can't attribute to anything traditionally Jewish, but you know, that doesn't mean that they're not, they're a contemporary Jewish practice, right? Like Judaism is evolving. Witchcraft is an interesting moment right now. Um, so the, the, I, 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 anything, anything that's like attributed in the book is a tribute, you know, is, is a source material, but, um, but Yeah. And I, like, I had to think through, there were things like, like, I didn't know, I, I'm probably going to mispronounce things because these are, but as children do, right? Like things I've read, but not talked to anybody about. Um, but discovering that, like, the, 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 the Dybbuk has this counterpart, the Eber, that was, you know, is like a good uh, disembodied spirit um, that has not moved on or whatever, things like that. Th those came from, like, actual sitting down with actual research materials and other library. Um, there isn't a bibliography in the book. I, I haven't thought about it until this moment, but um, but I should make one and put it online. I follow a Instagrammer uh, that goes by Jew Witches. Mm -hmm. and, I do too. And, and she merges the, the two together in it. Um, and now I just think of the book when, when I'm reading some of what she's written. Well, and I think I, for me, I was really interested in these kinds of things as a kid. Um, I just was interested in belief and magic in general. Like I just was always looking, I mean, I have a graphic memoir that'll be out in a few years called Fairy Hunter. That's about that. That sort of, I was just interested in belief and in the things that sort of we couldn't see or prove and wanting to believe in a world, whether you call it religious or magical, 
I wanted very much to believe that there were things in the world that were better than what I had access to. I wanted to believe that there were things that were beyond my understanding, um, which of course there are, but, uh, and, and was sort of always looking for them. And if, if I had had access in middle school to the idea that there was Jewish, like a Jewish magical practice, which there is, that goes back thousands of years, this is not new. Um, I would have become obsessed with it. Like, I would have, yeah. So you're kind of already touching on this. So I want to ask you this question because um, magic, not just Jewish magic, is really a through line in so many of your novels. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, even if there isn't a mythology that like exists that readers can um, look up in books, like, uh, you know, there's, there is obviously a logic to it and right. rules. Um, I actually heard on another interview, you said you like to leave your readers with questions. Yes. Um, so, but I wanted to ask, um, do you have the answers to these questions? And yeah. how do you respond when a fan asks you about yeah. something that's not in the text? This is, it's always funny. Um, so the answer is yes. I, I don't write a book leave the reader with. I need to know that the system works, right? It's, it's like finishing like a proof in a math class or something. Like if I can't make it fit, there's probably a hole somewhere else that somebody else is gonna find, right? Like an ambiguous ending or a, a sort of mysterious element is one thing, but, but if, if the pieces don't connect, then the book doesn't work. So I have to make sure that I work it all out. The book that this really comes up with is Orphan Island, which has a very ambiguous ending. Um, but I know the story behind the island. I know what the magical system is. I know the name and height and hair color of every child that's ever set foot on the island. Like, I know why they're there and how they got there. Um, and what I always say to kids, and I, I respond a little differently to grownups than I do to kids, because kids are much more likely to come up to me with like a whispered question and be like, I think I figured something out. Is this true? And if that kid gets it, if they know something, they figured something out, I'm going to give them the answer. I'm going to say, yes, absolutely. That's the case. And also I might give them a little bit more. I might say, you figured that out. So I will tell you this other thing um, because they're doing the work. Grownups get frustrated and, and are just like, ah, like, I think it's good for kids in book clubs, but like, I want to know the answer. <laughs> and those people I generally don't give the answer to. Um, uh, but but it's important for me that the whole system work. It's important for me to leave something increasingly with the last few books, to leave something unexplained. And sometimes, so like there's an element in my Jasper June that is a question, which in this book is answered by like, so there's a mouse that runs through my book, my Jasper June, and it's not clear whether the mouse is or isn't a magical element, like whether it's a weird coincidence or a magical element. This book tells you something about that mouse. Um, the same thing is true. I have a book bigger than a bread box and seven stories up. Seven stories up answers the question of how the bread box got to be the way that it is. And the books, they're not, they're not, you can read them in either order. It's not like they're sequels, but I want, I want those threads running through my books. Um, so I've been sort of doing this companion thing in that way. Uh, but, but the reason questions are important to me is even if it drives you crazy, a question requires continued thought. So this all started because my kids, I read with my children when they were young, The Little Prince, and they hated it. But they talked about it for weeks, trying to figure out about the snake, about the fox, about why, like, they, sort of the system of the planet. Like, they wanted, they wanted to figure out all these things. And I found myself thinking, like, this is what allegory does. And this is what open-ended questions do is they keep you trying to, I mean, this is what the Talmud does, right? Like nothing is ever final. As long as the ending is still open, you have to continue having a conversation about it because it's human nature to kind of keep worrying at that thing. Um, and I, I think that, that that kind of critical thinking and question asking is just really good for us, so. Do you think that's, um... Is that part of what makes writing for that age group, for the tweens, so satisfying that you can really, they're so questioning, I guess, at that age. I think of that, that's the age where they're not um, jaded. Well, I think, that, I think that kids this age believe 
they're at an interesting moment with magic, um, which is like they like the let's take the tooth fairy, right? Like they may still be getting tooth fairy stuff and not believing like they know that all their friends have given up on the tooth fairy, but like they're not a hundred percent on that. And I was like I was saying, so I all my books engage with magic. Um, I have this book that I was just talking about, Fairy Hunter, that is sort of the decoder ring for this question and for all of my other books, like that sort of explains why and how magic was so important to me. Um, that I think is related to the way that most kids interact with it, which is just they want they want the world to be as amazing as it can be. Like they want to believe that there's a unicorn that visits their yard at night or that in whatever version it is, whether whether it's religious or it's cultural, it's the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus. Um, you want to believe that there's goodness and and th that someday you might fly. You haven't flown yet, but someday you might fly. And I think it's related to all the other things you haven't done yet, right? Like you also haven't been to Paris yet, but someday you hope to go to Paris. You don't know that you'll get to be a rock star when you grow up, but that might happen. Like you just don't, there, there's a really fine line between potentiality and magic, right? Um, because at that age, you just don't know what's possible. And so, and so there's, it's like a very thin veil <laughs> Um, but I think kids that age are still open to things that ultimately kind of close off. And you read, I think if you read a book with magic in it when you're 20, you may still be somebody who loves magic, but the likelihood that you, some part of you is still reaching for that in your own life, I think is less likely. When a 10 year old picks up a book, I think that they are still, they still, a lot of them still have that openness to the potential. Um, and I certainly at that age, like up, up into middle school for sure. And maybe still to this day, like I, I still feel like there are things I don't understand, can't explain and haven't seen that I'm going to find before I die. It's for me, it's the, uh, the wardrobe, the yep. lion of the wardrobe. As a kid, I would, if I saw a big wardrobe, I'd want to sit in it because just maybe, yep. um, and there's a part of me that still, when I see a wardrobe, I think, oh, could could that lead me to Narnia? Yes, and every now and then you see like a, some article about a fairy circle in Ireland or, you know, some weird phenomenon and some little part of you wakes up and thinks, maybe, like me, just a little bit maybe. Um, but I think that kids that age have so much of that in them. And, yeah. and they're at that weird moment of like, I mean, very much like B and Zippy, like, some of them have given that up. Some of them are in the process of want to give it up. They like they 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 want it's the Susan question in the line, the witch in the wardrobe, right? That Susan gets to an age where she wants makeup and silk stockings, and it's time for her to stop going into Narnia. I love that line. Like 10 minutes before Susan is told she can't come back to Narnia, where she's like, I mean, it's not in the book, but like 10 minutes before or a day before susan was still somebody who could be in narnia and now she can't anymore that line for me is really interesting you mentioned earlier that this is your eighth middle grade novel and um i'm wondering what has changed for you about writing for that age over time i know you've talked a little bit about the age of your children as you're writing your books has like been a source of inspiration um, so how how do you feel like it's different now writing for that age group and writing characters that are in that age group? Yeah, so that's nobody's asked me that. That's a really interesting question. Um, so I feel like until my kids hit the age that they began to outgrow my books, I was really writing like I feel like I wrote middle grade because middle grade speaks to me initially. And so my first two books, I was really imitating different books, like in some ways you know, my first book was kind of a hodgepodge of like, it was like a little bit P.L. Travers, Mary Poppins, a little bit James Thurber, The 13 Clocks. The second book was very much a tribute to uh, Edward Eager's Half Magic. Like my early books, the, the first few books, I was really reaching for a text, like a mentor text that I loved. Um, then I hit the ages where my kids were sort of growing into that age. And I looked at them and I realized, wait a minute, I've been writing to these classic middle grade novels that I loved when I was that age. But a sixth grader today is not is not like an 11 year old today who's in sixth grade at a regular middle school is not a half magic kid like the like the, the world has changed. 
And I think that kids in some ways stay the same and in other ways, the world is not the same. And so my, my older son came home from the first week of sixth grade and said something to me that made me go like, huh, none of these books are really about real middle schools. Like what's re like the tampons on the floor is the real middle school, right? The fact that somebody might be vaping in the bathroom is a real middle school. The fact that these kids cuss all the time <laughs> is a real middle school. And not all kids do, but the idea that they would go to school and not be exposed to those things feels very unlikely to me. And so something happened for me right around the time that I was working on like somewhere in between like Bigger Than a Bread Box and Orphan Island, something happened to me where I realized I wanted to age my middle grade up, that I wanted to be writing books for middle, like that I felt like most of the books about 12 year olds were actually being read by nine year olds because the 12 year olds knew that that's not what the world looks like anymore. And so I feel like for my last now three books, very consciously, I'm trying, I'm really trying to write a real 12 year old. Um, or 13, whatever, um, but that I was really trying to set these books in a place where, where basically where the average, not that there's an average kid, but where a kid I know might pick it up, read it and say, yeah, she knows what middle school is. Like she's, she's been in the hallways, she's been in the bathroom, she knows what's going on. And she knows that like, sometimes you have a slumber party and you still play My Little Ponies. And sometimes you have a slumber party and you sneak out to meet a boy on the corner. And that could be the same kid on any given <laughs> night, right? Like. That's the weird thing about middle school is you are all the things you contain all the multitudes. And so I feel like that's that that's the big thing. It's less about my own children's ages and more that seeing them enter that world and realizing, wait, I write about 12 year olds, but I don't write about those 12 year olds um, made me feel like we were. And I think this, this is actually a marketing thing. Like I think publishers want to catch the like I get I have a book bigger uh, called seven stories up and there's a scene in it where the kid refers to her mom as the worst tooth fairy in the world and I get hate like hate mail from parents because their eight-year-old read this book and now I've ruined the tooth fairy but it's because their eight-year-old is reading a book about a 13-year-old so I, like I don't know what to say to that um but but I feel like that's something where like you have kids that are reading up and their parents bring them in and they say, no, no, they want a 400 page book. They want Lexile 1280. They want, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're past, you know, accelerated reader X or whatever it is. I mean, you know, you work in libraries, <laughs> like, and, and they're looking for, for a precocious reader to read a book and they don't want anything objectionable. That's complicated. It's hard for the writer. Totally get that. Um, I want to ask about the, some of the Jewish elements in the book. Um, Zippy is our narrator. She includes a lot of asides for readers who may not be familiar with Jewish traditions, yeah. like the bat mitzvah, um, but also like tachlich and tikkun olam and some of the other concepts. Um, why was it important to have to add those in, those asides? Yeah, I, so I feel like I feel like Jewish content is actually the great equalizer in the Jewish community. I feel like as somebody who grew up with an, in an intermarried family, and I, the, the other thing is, it's not just that I grew up in an intermarried family. I grew up in a family that didn't live in a Jewish neighborhood. My dad was very political and made a very conscious decision to move us into the city of Baltimore and away from the Jewish community that he'd grown up in. So I grew up in a school that didn't have a lot of Jewish kids in a neighborhood that didn't have a lot of Jewish kids. And as a result of that, like when I sort of entered the sort of spaces that felt fully Jewish, I often felt like I'm I'm mispronouncing this word because nobody ever says it in my house or like I don't know what I don't know how to make babka or, you know, whatever. And it sometimes feels like in the Jewish community, I used to work for Hillel and it sometimes felt like there was this idea that like you could throw like bagels <laughs> into an event and make it Jewish. It's like, oh, we're going to watch a movie. It's like movie and bagels or it's, you know, pizza in the hut for Sukkot or whatever it is. Like we're going to sort of throw throw Jewish trappings in and that's going to lower the barriers. And then people are going to feel welcome to come, even if even if they don't feel maybe like they know everything. And I understand that instinct and I've certainly participated in that. But I actually think that in a bigger way, Jewish content is the equalizer. That if I can't learn, like a, I can't get myself a Yiddish speaking grandma, I can't know natural, like how to make the perfect brisket, but I can read a book that teaches me things about Jewish practice, about Jewish ritual, about Jewish history, Jewish art, 
folklore, things like that. And that was the kid that I was. So I went and I like read any Jewish book I could get my hands on. And then I went to college and I did Jewish studies in college. And like, it was very much for me something where the content was like, I can gather this together. If I read enough Chaim Potok novels, like I may, I may never know, you know, how to quite pronounce that word correctly, but I can know as, I can know as much as anybody about, you know, whatever the, the, the golem of Prague or whatever I can, I can learn. And, um, and so I think that was a big part of it is wanting to say like, there are kids out there who don't, who, who I know some of them who have one Jewish parent, or maybe they have two Jewish parents, but their parents aren't involved or engaged or belonging to a synagogue or anything like that, or they don't live near their Jewish family. And so they don't do big family celebrations, things like that. But I, I can't give those people the feeling of going to your grandmother's house to break fast, but I can give them some ideas and some words and some things that they like starting points for things to learn, which for me, and I know that I'm a, I was a weird kid, but like for me, those things were very soothing, feeling like I could know things. And this is coming very full circle because of how you answered the first question about what book you wanted to see in the world, like what representation of Jewish experiences and, and yep. families you wanted to see. Um, so going back to you as a kid and you finding your identity as a writer, which is also something Zippy shares as um, like her narration is as, as a writer, as somebody that yeah. is uh, trying to put to paper this experience for someone else to read and believe and um, you know, ask questions about um, what was your pathway like to becoming to becoming a writer? So I started writing when I was about eight years old. Um, this is actually what I when I talk to kids at school visits. This is a lot of what I talk about. I was so I started writing when I was about eight. Um, and and what I always say, this is very much my adult brain talking. I don't think I knew this then, but I'm an extrovert. I'm very social, and I was very lonely. And what I realized, I think, at some point was that books and the page were were not going to go away. That like I could like I can't get myself invited to the birthday party. And if I sit down with somebody at lunch, they can get up and leave. But if if I if I engage with words, they will be there for me. And I think books were that way. The library was that way. I mean, I spent I, I may have talked about this in the last visit because I feel like I always bring it up when I'm with librarians. But there was a whole cohort of kids from my school who instead of going to the after school program, just walked across the street to the public library every day after school. And we just lived there. Like we were just at the library until your parents came to pick you up. And sometimes the library closed and you sat on the steps and eventually your parents came to pick you up. But so I spent like four hours a day at the library for years. And there was this whole crew of us. And of that crew of kids, four of them are now published authors. Like four of like wow. the 10 kids that went to the library every, like your libraries have all of their books in them, I promise. Um, and I feel like that, like, it's just that if books welcome you, if books hold you and keep you company, the next step is to want to participate with them, right? But like, in the same way that you walk into a party and if a bunch of people gather you up and chat with you in the kitchen all night, you're going to seek those people out again. Um, and I feel like, so it was a sort of like, I've been taking this in, I've been taking this in, and now I want to put it back out. So I, that's my adult explanation for, I think, what happened. But the other piece is that, um, that my best friend and I did this. So I, I had one really close friend in elementary school um, and she and I started doing this together and making little books. So we would like go outside and play an imaginary game where we were like unicorn trainers. And then we'd come inside and we'd like write down the story of the unicorn trainers and draw pictures and make a little book and staple it together. Um, so so I, had a, and I had a very wonderful teacher in ninth grade, Mrs. Powell, who encouraged that. Um, so that was really the beginning. And I, I, what I always tell kids is like, it hasn't changed very much. <laughs> like that process is pretty much what it always was. But then I got to high school and we had a creative writing teacher, uh, which not all schools do. We had a poet on faculty who, who ran an actual creative writing class and oversaw the literary magazine. And that was really encouraging. And so I think those are the two pieces. Like I started writing, I kept writing. And then at exactly the age where we were starting to think about like, what do you wanna be when you grow up for real? Um, I actually knew somebody who was a professional poet and that was his life. And so I had a model for that. And then I went to college and then I went to graduate school for an MFA 
um, in writing. So at that point, it was sort of like, well, now I've invested in this. I'm going to stick with it. But it's hard to imagine not writing. Like, I, like even if I can't publish, even if AI takes over the world and all the publishers disappear and nobody wants to buy my books anymore, I just can't imagine not writing. Do you have any advice for new writers or, or high school kids who are wondering, like, will AI take over the world? Will I be able to... Yeah, I do. <laughs> I have a lot of advice. I mean, the first of it, the, the AI question, like I just circ I circumvent it almost entirely by saying like, AI can provide copy. Like that's going to happen. There's going to be content from AI, just like there's content from lots of millions of other people who want to write. Um, like your story, the story, the only story you want to write is the story that only you can write, right? Like you don't want to write a story the AI is going to write. You want to write the story you want to write. And no amount of AI can displace that particular narrative. No one's going to write your book. And so if you want to write a book, you should do that and you should make it as good as you can. But the reason you do it isn't because you're going to publish a book. You do it because it's really good for you. Like you do it because it makes you a whole person. You know, the AI might also like bake chocolate chip cookies, but like, like that doesn't mean you don't want the experience of baking and eating raw cookie dough and smelling the house, you know, like things, experiences are really good for you. And writing for me is one of the most important experiences. And it is the most magical. I mean, I believe that writing is magic. Like I, I made these little pencils actually to give out at school visits that say, this is a magic wand. Like I genuinely believe that the process of writing is a sort of alchemical magical process. It changes the world, but also it changes us when we do it. And so that's my little like pep talk that gets me through the whole thinking about the doom stuff. Um, but my practical advice for writers is simply the hardest thing about writing today is that there's too many distractions. You know, there's just too much good television. There's too many video games. There's always something happening in your pocket when your phone's buzzing. And so the most important thing is just to find ways to separate yourself from the distractions. And so what I always tell kids but it's really the same advice I would give anybody is if you can take 10 minutes a day and lay on the floor and stare at the ceiling, completely disconnected from everything else. And you can call it meditation. You can call it, call it whatever you want, but like 10 minutes laying on the floor, no book, no music, nobody to talk to, no email, no nothing. And just think for yourself for 10 minutes. And then you have a notebook and you write down one sentence a day in that notebook, disconnected again from functionality, from publishing, from anybody's assignment. You think 10 minutes, you write down one sentence in your notebook. And I just think then you are a writer. Like, and, and sometimes the sentence is exciting and it takes over and you want to write a page or you want to write a novel. But mostly it doesn't. But it's still really, really good for you. So that's what I got. It's a great answer. Thank you. I think it's true. I don't know if it's, I yeah. it's great, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's like one of the few things I ever say where I'm like 100%, this is true. I've heard before, like, there's so much pre-writing that happens that's not the act of actually putting words to the page. So I think, yeah, not having input in your brain, like watching something or listening to something, it makes sense that you'd be able to have more output. Yeah, no, this is what a book looks like. Like, <laughs> this is, it, it, it's just scraps of paper. Like, it, it hasn't changed since I was eight years old, really. Like... And a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time I write longhand. Um, and a lot of the time I write outside. I also do, let's see if this is one. Like, this counts, right? Like, it's not, it, like, I was just, just going outside and painting what you see, writing about what you see. Sometimes I do this thing. So this was my zippy box. I go outside and I take a walk. And I just gather things that I see or I wander around my house. So these are like things that to me said something about Zippy because the whole goal is to disconnect, right? Like I just want to be in my story. I want to get as far away from the rest of the world as I can and just be in my story. And so if taking a walk or taking a bubble bath or crawling back into bed after the kids go to school and laying under the covers and thinking, oh, it's magic. <laughs> um, like whatever it takes to disconnect is the most important thing. Um, so when you are a, connected, do you huh? have um, something that you watched or read or experienced recently um, that you would recommend? Something that comes I, to mind. I being, do. Yeah. I just I just had a launch event 
uh, with another author, which I had never done before, but we both had spring with sort of books coming out this spring that were about middle, middle grade witches. Um, and uh, her name is, I'm going to try to get it right, um, Mayon Pasue Valchov, I think. And uh, she's lovely and brilliant. And she has this book called There Flies the Witch. Um, that is a, a sort of, in, it has a very folkloric feel also, but it's, it's an, I now know it's an invented world. It's an invented character. Um, but it has a very, almost like a sort of archetypal feel to it about uh, a young girl uh, and, and a witch who live alone in a cave. And I don't want to, I don't want to give it away, but, and like sort of, they leave the cave and sort of things happen. And, um, but it was an, a really unusual book. Like it feels, I always say like Katie Camilla's books feel like a gem to me. They're, they're small and compact, but there's so much inside them. This had a similar, it doesn't feel like Katie Camilla, but it had a similar quality of that, of like, the book is so small and it, it feels like she couldn't have gotten so much into something so small. Um, there are very few characters. It's very spare and sort of sparse, um, but just beautiful, beautiful language and really interesting stuff with language, really interesting sort of syntactical stuff, really cool. So I highly recommend that. Um, that is something that I love. I wrote that title down. I'm gonna it's that. really, yeah, go look it up. It's, it's, you're going to read it and be like, wow, like it's just different than anything I'd read in a long time. Are there any authors or books or other media that um, that represent Jewish faith that you would recommend? You know, so I just I just wrote a piece for Hornbook that'll be out in the fall that uh, had me revisiting the the text that I think was my big Jewish text as a kid because there just weren't very many, mm -hmm. um, and the ones that there were often weren't books that I loved them, but they didn't they didn't look like my life at all. Um, and that book was a Chaim Potok book called Davida's Harp. That um, it was the first time I ever saw an intermarriage. Um, it's set in the 1930s in in uh, Brooklyn, and uh, her father's a communist. Her parents are communists, basically, um, but they're sort of living outside the communities. But it has this very interesting magical element in it that I, I don't think it's intended to be read as magic. I think it's to, intended to be read as dream or surreal or something like that. But um, but because I read it young, because I read it when I was still really a middle grade reader and it's an adult book, I read it as magic. There's a, a door harp on Davida's door and there are these birds from a story that her uncle tells her that live inside the harp. Just a really, it actually reminded me like of older, like if you've read Shosha by Isaac the Shabbos Singer, which is another mm -hmm. another book I really loved. Really sort of odd, sort of, it has a very Eastern European kind of surreal magical feel to it of like something odd is happening, but the rest of the world, the rest of the world is still the world. Um, and those are the books that I love best. Books where there's something, I always, I, I think of it as turning down the magic dial. Like, there's something magical. There's something that makes you say, wait, this isn't, this isn't the world as it usually is, but it's not a wizard or a dragon or a, you know, it's not a clearly defined magical system um, are the things that I love a lot. And I'll also give a plug. I've been listening to another, I, I did an interview on another podcast called Judaism Unbound. That's really, really interesting for people who might be interested in this same kind of like sort of, new ways of thinking about Judaism, people doing Judaism in different communities or in different modes, a lot of stuff about like what's how things are being done online or um, I mean, it could be anything like like uh, gender diversity in the Jewish community and how we struggle with language. Like there's just so many interesting conversations happening right now um, in sort of how we interpret and think about our Jewish lives. Um, and I think I think if I hadn't started writing this book, I wouldn't have done such a deep dive into and discovered Jewishes or you know Jewish demonology or this podcast that I'm talking about. So, so we're getting closer to the end, um, but we did want to ask: um, How can your fans contact you? Um, I am. I'm actually going to take a little break for June and go off social media. This is the first time I've said that out loud, but I'm gonna do it. 
Um, but I'm always available through email. If anybody really has a question or they really want to share something, I'm particularly with kids, but, um, but I'm always available through email through my website. Um, and, uh, and I'm usually, I, I'll probably leave my Instagram feed up even for June, uh, just cause, cause I don't use that one as addictively. <laughs> um, but, but in, in my usual life prior to certain changes in Twitter's world, um, I, I've always been a big Twitter fan and that's been really heartbreaking for me. So, so I'm usually on Twitter, but not as much as I used to be. Can you talk about what your next projects are? I know you mentioned one uh, graphic novel. You said yeah. So I'm doing a, I'm doing a graphic novel called Fairy Hunter that I finished a while back, but the art is being done now um, with Trung Nguyen, uh, who did the Magic Fish. Yeah, I'm so excited. Wow. And I'll, I'll I if you go to my Instagram feed, it scroll down a little bit. As my son tells me, I post too much to Instagram. But uh, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a there's a rough sketch from from that book um, that he posted that I doesn't look like a rough sketch to me, but I guess it is. Um, it's beautiful. I'm very very excited about that. And that is a it's about my parents' divorce. It's about um, it's about magic. It's about my best friend. But it's also about I have epilepsy, and which feeds into all of this. That sort of my childhood was filled with things I could see but nobody else couldn't. That I think had a real effect on me. Um, yeah, so that's coming. And then I have a picture book coming out, uh, also, I think in 2025 with, uh, Lei Wen Pham. Uh, it's called Shrinking Violet about a girl who shrinks when she gets scared and grows when she gets angry. Um, and it's so like a sort of little fairy tale kind of thing. So that's coming. And then I have a couple of books that I don't have an artist for yet, so I can't describe them terribly well, but I do have a I just sold a picture book to my uh, the same editor that works on my novels, Jordan Brown at Walden Pond, um, to do with Balzer and Bray. Uh, a, it's called Book of Candles, and uh, it's a Hanukkah. It's sort of a, a, Han a poem for a Hanukkah, a home, home for the eight nights of Hanukkah. Nice. So and are you time. able to go back? I know you did a book with Dan Santat, the uh, uh, fairy tale Endless. book. Yeah. Are and you we able are to Sorry, what were you going to say? I jumped oh, in. if you're able to, like, you know, ask your editor, like, can we go with this person again? Are they, how does? Well, that one, Dan and I wanted to do another book. So, so I, and I, I, I don't know where we are in the contractual process yet, but we're doing a, we are doing another book like Endlessly Ever After, but it's different. And I don't want to say more than that at this okay. stage. Um, uh, but that's me and Dan Santat. Um, it's, that one was an interesting one where it happened because we're friends. And so he was in town to do an event at a bookstore here. And my kids and I went to have dinner with him and we happened to start chatting. And he said, what are you working on? And I told him about it and he said, ooh, send me that. So every now and then that happens where sort of if the author and the illustrator both know they want to work on something together um, and are you know able to work out the financial details and stuff like that. The bigger problem with art is you can have like, like Phoebe Wall is somebody that I would love to do a book with, but she's probably got like four books stacked up. So by the time I write the book that would feel like a good fit for her and we take it to her, what's likely is that if Phoebe likes the book, she's going to say, and I'm just picking her because I happen to have been looking at her Instagram feed today because she is awesome and everybody should go read her books. But, um, but uh, if, if, if I send my editor a book that feels like a Phoebe Wall book and they send it to Phoebe, she's likely to say, I'd love to do it, but I can't get to it for six years. Like, because the art just takes so much longer than the writing for a picture book. Uh, so, so often that's the case where sort of you like someone and they might like you, but the timing just doesn't work. Um, or a lot of the time with illustrators, I mean, this is true for all of us, right? The world's gotten more expensive. And I think there's a difficult thing happening right now where, where people are starting to have to say like, I'm going to need more than that. And the publishers, their things are getting more expensive for the publishers at the same time. So I think we're trying to figure out right now, like what things cost in a way that we haven't had to do in a while. So I, I haven't, this hasn't actually happened to me, but, but I keep hearing that like, that's a challenge that, you know, what, what felt like the right amount of money for an illustration job three years ago, doesn't feel like the right amount of money anymore. If it's going to take you six months to finish the project. Um, 
So that's probably more shop talk than anybody really wants to hear. But I don't know. As librarians, I love to hear the yeah. It's the I mean, all, the yeah. The 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 economic stuff is just affecting every aspect of our world right now. You know, like you go to the grocery store and it's just different. And we're all figuring that out. So it'll all get itself sorted out. But there's, I think it's challenging right now for publishers. For sure. Well, should we, um, what, we can look and see if there are any questions in the comments, but while those uh, may be brewing, can we ask you some rapid fire questions? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, so would you rather stop time or fly? Oh, I would rather fly. I, that is, that's my power. That's the superpower I want more than anything in the world. Stopping time, I feel like, would get very complicated. Yeah. It not be as fun, maybe. No. Like, flying is just flying. Yeah. Uh, would you rather, so, I mean, this is probably answered, asked and answered, would you rather be a bird or a mountain? I would rather be a bird. I feel like I, I feel like I'm definitely a bird, not a mountain. See, previous answer. Yes. <laughs> fine. The above. Um, okay, so if you were asked to hide an elephant, where would you do it and why? I mean, in a, I don't know, in an elephant enclosure at the zoo? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We did yeah. not come up with that question. That was that, not ours. I, <laughs> I mean, if there's... I would like to see somebody who can find a good answer for that one. I'm not sure what it would be. <coughs> what's more, <coughs> oh, excuse me. What's more annoying, soft talkers or loud talkers? Oh, I fear yeah. it's loud talkers, but I'm one of them. So um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's loud talkers. I was shushed by a child in the library today. <laughs> so I can relate. That's um, perfect. <laughs> would you rather be in a Netflix documentary as the subject or the opponent of the subject? Oh, I mean, I'd rather be the subject, but I'm likelier to be the opponent of the subject, I suppose. You know, that's interesting. So my favorite, like my favorite current musician just had a documentary done about him on HBO. Yeah, which I'll give a plug to. Everybody go watch the Jason Isbell documentary. It's amazing. But he said something about like, if you can't, like there's two kinds of documentaries, the kind that are done for marketing and the kind that make you uncomfortable or something like that. And that like, if you're not, like you shouldn't do that. Or maybe he didn't say shouldn't, but like that you shouldn't do this if you're not willing to like make art basically. So I guess the point is every Netflix Subject needs an opponent, or it wouldn't be good TV. That's a very writerly answer. There has to be conflict. <laughs> well, with that, I think we are out of time. And I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us. And we thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to be here and see you guys. Yeah. Thanks again. And we want to thank all of our audience uh, who enjoyed this conversation with Laurel Snyder. And remember to visit lapl.org forward slash events to see more of our amazing programs and check the Your Author landing page at lapl.org forward slash your author for our next Your Author program. And we also want to mention that the Los Angeles Public Libraries Summer Reading Challenge will be starting on June 5th. And for more information, you can visit lapl.org backslash summer. And until next time, we truly appreciate all of you who joined us here today. And um, our library programs in person and virtual are all successful because of you. So thank you very much and have a great long weekend. Bye. Thank you.